Welcome everybody to tonight's Metro DC EDS and HSD support group meeting. We have we are excited to have Dr. Alyssa Zingman with us to discuss diagnosing and treating EDS. Uh, Kendra Nielsen Miles will be giving an introduction as well as moderating the Q&A. So I will now turn it over to her and thank you again everybody for joining us. Welcome everybody. And I wanted to give a quick introduction to Dr. Zingman. Dr. Zingman, thank you for being here. Um, Dr. Zingman is a board certified physician with nine years of experience and training in orthopedics and preventative medicine. She earned her medical degree at University of Maryland School of Medicine and went on to academic orthopedic surgery residency at the University of Rochester. She completed her residency in preventative medicine at Johns Hopkins. Prior to medical school, she was a professional dancer, Pilates instructor, and completed her undergraduate degree in, at Columbia University. She believes that research is critical to moving our field forward, and her research endeavors have included injury prevention, upper extremity, extremity surgery and rehabilitation, rotator cuff injury, hand surgery and neuropathy, ACL injury prevention, dance injuries, female athlete triad, and neural... Oh, gosh. Neuro... Had neuroradiology, sorry, I had to zoom in on that, neuroradiology and nervous system development. She also has connective tissue disorder called Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, hypermobility, hypermobility type. And as a result, she has had five orthopedic surgeries, several herniated discs in, my, in her spine and is left uh, and had to leave her orthopedic surgery residency to pursue in invent, intensive rehabilitation for her spine and pelvis. Following this, she resumed medical training in preventive, med preventive medicine at Johns Hopkins, and she's board certified by the American Board of Preventive Medicine. So welcome, Dr. Zingman. Thank you. Um, it's, it's good to be here. I'm happy to speak with everybody. Um, what I was thinking I would kind of do today is go over the HEDS diagnostic worksheet quickly, um, and then kind of go through how do we approach care in our paradigm, I guess you would call it, um, at PRISM and, um, you know, collaborating with a lot of other uh, physicians from around the country, physical therapists and other people um, to kind of come up with a way to try to look at the patient holistically um, and not like, I'm just treating the shoulder instability and you have to go to eight other offices for the eight other things that are going on right now. So, um, before that, I'll just tell you a little bit about my diagnostic journey. I'm sure um, this is a familiar story for many of you, unfortunately. So I first noticed that I kind of got injured more than other people kind of uh, in fourth or fifth grade and started asking kind of, you know, is there anything that I like, need to do different? Maybe there's something with my nutrition. Maybe there's something about, you know, how I'm made that isn't the same as everybody else. Um, and my mom, um, is the same way. And so is my grandmother and their kind of, you know, secret of their success was just that they always stayed really, really strong. Always, I mean, my grandmother lifted free weights until she was 92 or 93. Um, she walked on the treadmill, uh, past that to the point where it was terrifying that she was on a treadmill. Um, and so I just started being someone who exercised for hours every day, doing very small movement exercises to try to stabilize various parts of my body at a very young age. Um, in high school, I actually did a project with Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, um, where I left school early, um, I think three days a week, and looked at biomechanics for dancers. I was a dancer um, and, you know, was reading kinesiology books. And this has just always been an area, I think, because of my personal experience with it, that has held a lot of interest for me. Um, and, you know, I always say, most of what I do is just a really solid under, uh, knowledge of anatomy and a really solid understanding of physics and just putting those things together and figuring it out. Um, I tried to get diagnosed with EDS right after the day in med school that I think we had one to three slides total the whole time I was in med school on, on uh, EDS. But when we had that slide or two, 
I immediately said, oh, that has to be me. Um, and I did try to go get diagnosed and I was laughed out of the room, told that I was a hypochondriac. Every medical student thinks they have some weird, rare disorder at some point during their four years and that I'm fine. And I shouldn't worry about it. I came back again after I started, after I had a shoulder, my first shoulder dislocation, which was also during med school. I went back again and said, you know, I really think I might have this. Um, and instead of sending me to a geneticist or rheumatologist, which is what I asked for, they sent me to um, a psychiatrist. And so um, the psychiatrist, I was telling and explaining to him how, actually I can't even remember if it was a man or a woman, but ab about how this is to the point it's interfering with my ability to sleep. It's interfering with my ability to concentrate. My neck and back hurt all the time. I'm spending, I mean, even in medical school, I was spending three to five hours a day doing exercises to keep myself able to study. Um, and so I would study for up to two hours and then I would go do 45 minutes, up to 45 minutes of exercise. I would just repeat that over and over again because every time I spent two hours sitting at a desk studying, it took me 30 to 60 minutes to undo the damage of having done that. Um, so it's a really tough way to kind of go through things. Anyway, they said, well, if you're having trouble concentrating, we'll give you Adderall. And I said, well, I don't know, like, you know, I went to Ivy League school and did really well and I never needed Adderall before. I, I just don't think that that's it. Um, and honestly, to this day, I have no idea if I have ADD or not. I mean, I, I certainly have some ADD tendencies and I can see where they would get that from, but um, the Adderall made me start having syncopal episodes, which was of course, because I had undiagnosed POTS. Um, and now that's not to be confused with that. Adderall is actually sometimes used for people who have like low tone, low blood pressure, low sympathetic activity as one of the sources of their POTS. That's not what my POTS is from. And it just made me way worse. Um, and my hair started falling out and I was like, all right. I'm done with doctors. Got to my fourth year of medical school, really wanted to be an orthopedic surgeon, but knew that if I did have a connective tissue disorder, this was probably not a good idea. So I tried one more time and I actually set up, I still couldn't get a referral from the student health uh, family medicine clinic. So I set up an appointment. I mean, I set up a rotation. It was one or two weeks long it, with genetics. Um, and then kind of after a clinic one day said, you know, I really think I might have this. Is there any chance you'd be willing to evaluate me and got um, yelled at for being inappropriate by asking that? Um, and that was the end of that. And I just went ahead and did orthopedic residency. It was very, very difficult. I mean, I, it certainly wasn't the same process for me that it was for other people in terms of the amount of effort required just to keep my body able to work those long hours and um, I just started getting like, I don't know how to describe it, but just sort of like fatigued more. I started kind of sleeping through things and then I got pregnant and it was game over. Um, and so that's how I ended up leaving my orthopedic surgery residency with the pregnancy. My thumbs were just subluxing constantly. I couldn't hold my instrument. I mean, there's no way I could have stayed. There were so I, I could sit here for an hour and tell you about all the different things I couldn't do. Um, and then I still didn't have a diagnosis, but I knew I had a connective tissue disorder. I was certain. And I just figured whatever it is, doesn't have a name yet. It's not Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but it's something kind of like that. Uh, these things are super rare is what I thought, because that's what I'd been told. Um, and I'm going to have to figure this out myself. And that's where I went back to my dance major in undergrad and my kinesiology classes that I took in undergrad and biomechanics for the dancer and my Pilates certification training that I had done before med school and, you know, my stuff I'd done at Johns Hopkins and all, all of that stuff. And I started putting it together and I finally saw Dr. Frank Bono in the fall of 2017. And that's when I got my diagnosis. I knew very little about EDS at the time. I knew mitral valve prolapse, joint subluxations. That was it. That was all I knew. Um, and that wasn't very long ago. So um, getting the diagnosis kind of started this ball rolling 
that this ball has just picked up momentum and grown in size as it's kind of uh, rolled. And when I started Prism, I really thought, you know, I, I was doing a job that was great. It was actually, um, I was the one of the doctors for the fire department and I did injury management and prevention for them, health promotion, and a lot of actually really interesting things that I enjoyed doing. But as I was learning more about EDS, I was realizing, oh my gosh, I have to go to nine different doctors and physical therapists. And I have to go to this physical therapist for this issue and that physical therapist for that issue. And it was just so time consuming. And I thought I need to just create somewhere where this is all in one place, because if I'm a doctor and I can't even navigate this, how is anybody else navigating it who didn't have the good fortune of getting to go to medical school before they got sick, you know? Um, and so I thought at Prism that I would probably work about three days a week. That would be very low key. I really thought that EDS was rare. So I did not think I was going to have a lot of patients or a wait list or uh, any attention on me. And I was just want, was going to quietly kind of do my thing. And I think um, probably most people know what happened from there, when we were three months in, we had a three month wait list. We were six months in, we had a nine month wait list. Um, and so I'm just seeing a message. Okay, we'll skip the HEDS checklist. Um, and that's how PRISM sort of grew was because the patients that I was seeing were asking for more services than what I was offering. And I wanted to be able to give that to them. And then also we had this really long wait list and every day people were calling us in tears that, you know, they don't know if they're going to make it till a year from now or two years from now or however long the wait list was at that point. Um, and I realized also that after some head and in concussion injuries and pneumonias and other things that I'd have my health was declining and I wasn't going to be able to do this myself. So that's when I started hiring other doctors, bringing more people in and growing the practice. Um, so that's kind of just a little brief um, history of how this all happened and how I ended up here. And, um, you know, I still feel kind of sometimes um, that it's an irony that people consider me an expert in things that I didn't know existed four years ago. Um, it, it really speaks to what a bad job we're doing as a medical community for these patients. Um, and it also speaks to the fact that this is learnable and that you, the information is out there. If you're looking for it and you're a doctor, you want to learn about it, you can learn about it. You can find the information. It's, it's there, not all the information, but enough information that you can really help people. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the approach that kind of crystallized for me over the course of my first year working at PRISM. And, and I have some slides to go with that. So um, this is a huge long PowerPoint that has a million different things in it. So I can kind of like go to whichever part whoever has asked me to speak most wants me to speak about, which when I asked what um, people most wanted me to speak about today, it was kind of how do we approach these patients and what do we do? So that's what I'm going to kind of cover today. So um, the program, I kind of, for ease of understanding, divided it into four parts. Um, and I'm going to go through each of those four, four parts in detail, organize, stabilize, mobilize, dynamize. Um, one of the first things I teach people, so whenever a new staff member is coming to work at PRISM as, in a clinical role, they spend a minimum of one month just glued to me for, and, and I'll put them with other people in the practice too. I'll put them with Dr. Henderson. I'll put them with Dr. Maitland if they're going to be doing stuff related to MCAS, but I mean, they just spend full time one month. It's their job. I'm paying them to do it. And all they're doing is learning. I'm giving them articles to read. We're discussing the articles. Um, and one of the first things I always say to anybody who's going to be doing any manual work with patients is you don't organize it without stabilizing it. So what I mean by that is we don't want to be a place that just puts joints back into alignment and then sends you out into the world without making sure that 
you, your body is able to create some stability in that position. Um, and so let's talk about organize because organize um, covers a lot. So the first and most obvious part of organize is related to the musculoskeletal system. So that's getting all the joints into alignment, restoring proper mu muscle contractility and firing patterns, proper breathing mechanics. Um, there may be fascial work involved. There um, occasionally we'll do dry needling uh, to kind of get something, but the focus is really on, we want the bones to be seated in their proper position, in their proper orientation, at their proper width and length. And we want the muscles to be able to fire and we don't want muscle or fascial tension pulling them back out of place, like uh, whether it's compressing things together, almost like the way you jam your finger playing basketball, things can get uh, compressed together or whether it's something kind of hanging off the body because and, and not supported up in the joint. Um, so that's musculoskeletal. Um, the other two parts of it are less obvious. So neurologic, um, a lot of this has to do with sympathetic and parasympathetic tone and trying to balance that out. Because what I think happens to a lot of people with EDS is everyone around us who is in good health and doesn't have EDS, they're stacking wooden blocks to stay upright. We're stacking bean bags, or if we're really, really hypermobile, we're stacking water balloons. So the amount of attention, care, and functionality of the nervous system and the muscles and all of that is that much more important for this population than it is for other pop patient populations. Um, so POTS is the obvious thing, but also anxiety, PTSD that's untreated, poor sleep, um, anything that's putting your body into a stress state and like keeping your body in a fight or, fight or flight type of state we want to address. Um, we use a million techniques. I can't fit them all on a slide. Uh, osteopathic techniques, vagal nerve exercises. We take stuff from Alexander technique, take a lot of stuff from Pilates. We take stuff from gyrotonic, stuff from Feldenkrais. Um, there's a lot of, of good stuff out there that we kind of have cherry picked for what we feel is most likely to work best for this population. A um, lot of focus on breathing pelvic floor for this also. Um, breathing mechanics. Actually, this was a really cool paper that came out in either 2018 or 2020, somewhere in there, that the motor for cerebrospinal fluid flow is actually breathing. Um, and so it's so interconnected, you know, um, and I'm a really big fan of, I don't argue with success. So Ayurveda, acupressure. We used to have an acupuncturist here. She moved away um, and we didn't replace her because all along the mission of PRISM that I've tried to stick really close to is to bridge the gap between what this community of patients need and what is available for them elsewhere. So our goal is not to be replicating services that are available elsewhere. Um, I've strayed from that a teeny bit based on some surveys I've given to our patients who, for instance, expressed really strongly that they would like to get their prolotherapy here because we can put them into alignment for it right then and there. They can get the shot. We can calm everything down right after. And they just really, you know, they really wanted that here. So we now offer that here. But for the most part, most of the things we do here are things that we felt like would be hard to find in the, in the community. Um, the third part of organized is all about inflammation. So generalized information, inflammation could be allergies. It could be mast cell dysfunction. Um, it could be a true immunodeficiency. It could be a rheumatologic condition, um, which are three to four times as common in EDS patients as in non-EDS patients. 
Uh, it could be something environmental like mold uh, exposure or smoking or something like that. Gastrointestinal inflammatory sources. Uh, there's been a lot of research in the past 10 years about the gut brain access. And I think more and more people are familiar with that, but I think what still gets ignored too much is the gut joint axis and inflammation in the gut translating into inflammation and in our case instability potentially in the joints. Sorry, I'm giving myself a little better drill because I'm having a little bit of a hive type day. I'm getting one right here. I don't know if it shows up. <laughs> um, here we go. Okay, that should do it. So um, central nervous system, we may use something like lotus naltrexone. Um, if there's a lot of movement in the C-spine, whether it's hypermobility or instability, and we're concerned that that is causing the body um, to causing like brainstem inflammation or some other sort of spinal cord inflammation, we might use bracing for symptom reduction. Bracing can also separately be used as a diagnostic tool, um, to try to guesstimate which symptoms are attributable to what. And so if you brace the neck and you're concerned for, let's say, lanoaxial instability, um, and 50% of the symptoms get better when you brace the neck. And it really was good bracing. It fit the patient well. They did not tolerate it because their jaw and they really wore it full time for two weeks. Whatever didn't get better during that two weeks, we need to look for, was it something other than the C12 instability that was causing those symptoms, right? Um, and then uh, the MSK stuff is kind of self-explanatory. Um, I've said, I'm so sorry if you guys have like ever listened to my podcast or me speak before, because sometimes I'm a little broken record. I find an analogy that works and I just say it all the time. But one of my analogies that I say all the time is most mothers give birth to a Honda Accord, let's say. And with this condition, what's been birthed is a Formula One race car. And the owner's manuals are just very, very different. And the world is designed more for a Honda Accord than it is for a Formula One race car. Um, a Formula One race car can do things that on its best day, the Honda Accord could never do. Um, and, and there's you know a lot of fancy, amazing things about a Formula One race car. But if you try to give the Formula One race car the same fuel that you give the Honda Accord, you're going to end up with a broken down car. If you try to make the Formula One race car tow the same U-Haul trailer that you're towing in your Subaru Outback, you're going to have a very unhappy Formula One race car. So I think it's a lot about this idea that there's just a different owner's manual for this body. And part of what I consider to be our job is to kind of educate the patients on what is what does your owner's manual need to look like? What are the things, you know, if you have a Formula One race car, it has a pit crew, right? Um, but what are the things that you can do and kind of be your own pit crew? And then who do you need to be the other members of your pit crew and how to best utilize them? Um, Stabilize. Do I have another on stabilize? Okay. So stabilize includes a lot of isometrics, neurologic retraining. Um, sometimes we get a little creative with that. So um, if anyone has ever heard of EMDR, um, which is a rapid eye movement desensitization technique for PTSD, um, sometimes when we finally get someone's breathing proper, we'll have them close their eyes and stroke the ears or the shoulders to get those eye movements going because that helps with um, neural rewiring and circuitry. Um, the brain has a lot of plasticity, meaning that you can increase the number of neurons going from point A to point B by having the brain, by asking the brain to connect those two points repeatedly. Um, and so we wanna take advantage of that plasticity. Um, and a lot of patients, you know, even in order to talk or do the smallest gesture with their arm, they're kind of going into a clenched position because all of a sudden, if I'm doing this, 
there's a lever arm away from my torso that my torso has to be stable against. And even with my jaw moving, the jaw is like a lever arm on my upper C-spine that it has to stabilize. And so even just getting someone to maintain proper posture in a seated position while talking might be something that we would work on because if every time the person talks and we all talk multiple times throughout the day, obviously they are jutting their head forward, squeezing their shoulders back and bracing themselves. No amount of, get, of, of doing the organized stage is going to ever fix that, right? Um, and we wanna be making forward progress as much as we can with the understanding that this is never gonna be a car that doesn't need a pit crew. We want the reliance on the pit crew to decrease over time. Um, so that's stabilize. Um, people often ask me, how do you decide how much to brace? So sometimes you're bracing for diagnostic purposes, that's different. But when you're bracing for therapeutic purposes, my philosophy is the minimum required to avoid symptoms. And so you look at the timing and the duration. So let's say someone has CCI, their number one symptoms for their CCI are a sipital headache that radiates in the Rams foreign pattern and nausea. And I asked the person, do you wake up with it? And they say, yes. Okay, they have to sleep with the brace. I've asked the person, do you wake up with it? And they say, no. Then I say, okay, like at what point during the day do you think those symptoms start? Um, and sometimes they have to go home and pay attention for a week and get back to me on that. And that's fine. But let's say the person knows and they say, between 11 and 12. Okay, what time do you wake up? 8.30. Okay, so we got 8.30, 9.30, 10.30, 11. Two and a half hours that you can hold your own head up. Let's go half hour prior to that and say, you're gonna have two hours off the brace, half hour to an hour on the brace, and then repeat. Two hours off, half hour to an hour on. And then we can try to lengthen the two hours. We can try to shorten the hour or half hour that they're wearing it and try to decrease their dependency on it. Um, same exact way that I would decide, for instance, how often someone needs to wear their SI belt or any other brace um, that we were looking at. Um, this is an example of how organize and stabilize apply to a specific condition. Um, and the thing with organize and stabilize is the same way that a professional football player never graduates from weight training, stretching, balance training, calisthenics, drills to make sure their feet move quickly. No one ever graduates from organize and stabilize. What should happen over time is that you can get the same result in less time. So, so you don't have to spend as much time on organize as, as stabilize uh, and stabilize as you, and you can spend less time on those and still maintain wherever you are. Um, so if we're looking at the upper C-spine in organize, it's not just getting this into alignment. It's starting with the, the core, the base that this sits on. Um, and so it's pelvic alignment. The coccyx is so ignored. Um, probably my happiest patients are the ones who come into me never having been told that their coccyx could be out of alignment and they do have a coccyx out of alignment and we put it back into alignment and they like think the most amazing thing in the whole world has just happened. And it's really heartwarming, but it's also really tragic because something that takes less than a minute to do could have been done two years ago when this started. And maybe this person wouldn't have had this awful two years with all these downstream effects of the fact that they landed on their bottom and their coccyx was out of alignment for the past two years. Um, so uh, spinal alignment, rib cage alignment and biomechanics. Um, and then jaw and shoulder are huge. I consider jaw and shoulder to be a hundred percent of the time part of treating the neck. I call the, the TM joint, I call it C negative one. So you have C seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, negative one. Um, it's, it's basically part of the spine because it's a handle that can apply 
torque that you will feel all the way down the spine will affect a lot of different things. Um, so hugely important. Um, shoulder stability. The shoulders are kind of like, if you imagine there were two guys sitting here and they had all these lassos, like a lasso around your ear, a lasso around a little spike sticking off of this part of your head and this part of your head. And when the shoulders are sitting slumped low and forward out of the joint, it's like the guy holding those lassos jumped here and he's just flapping in the breeze. And so that creates a situation where we're never going to be able to get that neck feeling better if we don't address the shoulders. Um, stabilize also, um, can include prolotherapy and often does. Um, and it's pretty uncommon for us to choose to start with the neck. Um, even if the neck is the least, um, stable, most symptomatic part, because it would be like the foundation of the church is off. And so the whole tower is leaning. And so the steeple is off and the cross is starting to pull away from the steeple. And all I do is stick the cross back on properly. Well, I haven't really addressed what's going on with this structure, right? Um, I already kind of talked about REM and EMDR. Um, if you organize it, you stabilize it before the patient walks out the door. Very important principle. Um, okay, mobilize, mobilize. So, so Anybody who's been to PT knows that one of the simplest exercises that you'll be given in PT is like a heel slide where you're laying on your back and you slide your heel out and then you slide your heel in. Um, that would be a pretty advanced exercise here. We're not gonna probably, I mean, if someone comes to us and we catch them early and they're still super functional, maybe we'll get to that really quickly. But if someone comes to us and they're already, you know, have not able to work, they're not able to walk, five walks. They're not able, you know, to do all these things. Um, that's not going to be the first thing we do because in order to do that properly, all the movement has to happen at the sip hip socket. And that means your leg is a lever. It's a partially supported lever arm because your foot's on the ground, but it's still a lever arm. And what'll happen to the low back, if this is low back and the hip socket is here, I'll put it here is as the hip starts to go this way, the low back will do that. Right. And we need the person to be able to control the lumbopelvic junction and lumbopelvic alignment before we have them do this against it. Um, so it's all about the axial skeleton is your head, your spine, and your pelvis. Um, and some people say the ribs. The appendicular skeleton is your appendages. So shoulder down to fingertips, hips down to toes. So in most cases, not all, because sometimes someone just, what they really need is their footwork done or their thumb. Um, but in, in a lot of cases, we're going to start with the axial skeleton, get a stable base that we can then move these on a stable base. Um, movement initiation is really important. I kind of talked about that a little bit. If every time you want to lift your arm, you do this with your shoulder in order to lift it, uh, that's going to cause problems, you know, um, working on sit to stand, working on rotation. Um, I do something that I call pure planes. Um, and I just call it that. So we had a way to talk about it amongst ourselves. So we all knew what we were talking about. Um, but a lot of, uh, people, especially with hypermobility, uh, turn their head. Kind of, I'm not going to go all the way cause I'll hurt my neck, but turn their head kind of like that and to teach the person to turn only in this plane and also to teach them not to go forward as they turn or back as they turn. Um, all that kind of stuff is really important. Um, and then dynamize is, I made up that word, it's not a real word, but I couldn't think of something better. If you have some, if you have a better way to name this program, let me know. Um, but um, dynamize is like very specific to the patient goals. That's where the patient says, I really wanna be able to ride my bike to work. It's only two miles from my house. Can we work on the biomechanics for that? Right. Or I really want to be able to garden or I have two young children and I can't pick them up out of the crib. I have to ask for help with that. I really want to work on like a technique for that and strengthening whatever muscles I need to strengthen and learning whatever alignment 
cues I need to learn in order to be able to do that. Um, so that's, that's the dynamize piece. Um, I'm going to stop there. That's our approach. I got a little chat message that said to skip the diagnostic worksheet. So I skipped the diagnostic worksheet. Um, and how did I do on time? I think we have plenty of time for questions. Yes, we do. We have 15 minutes for questions. Okay, perfect. You are doing well. So if you, um, either you can read them. There's a couple in the Q and A. I have a couple that have also come through um, on email, so we can go either way. What would you like to do? I can start with the Q and A. Yeah, and I'm happy to read them for you if that makes it easier. Not that I have the best eyesight, but <laughs> I'm happy to read them for you if that makes it easier for you. There, it looks like there's somebody that that asked a question about. Can you talk to the diagnosis of photophania? Something that it's, like it's that that, that I diagnosed with. I, I think that must be photophonia maybe um light sensitivity that's all it just means light sensitivity sensitivity yeah. she said how is this similar or different to eds so i think you it's something that people with eds can have um and people without eds can have it and it can be due to a problem that is intrinsic to the eye that's an eye problem or can be due to a nervous system problem. Um, because in EDS, so the brain is held up in the skull where it belongs by these membrane, membranous structures that are made of connective tissue, of course, right? And so something that can happen in EDS patients is the brain is sitting lower in the head. And where this kind of um, when it's really low, it's a Chiari, right? But um, what can kind of happen is there's too much movement at the head neck junction. And also at the head neck junction is actually brain matter, not just spinal cord matter. Um, and so some of the cranial nerves um, and also because the cranial, some of the cranial nerves pass past there. Um, and also because of TMJ and some of the cranial nerves that are affected by the TMJ and the cranial nerves are the nerves that come off the brain stem. So they're, they're just above where this, where the brain stem becomes the spinal cord. Um, and they control eye movement, pupillary reflex and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then also another reason that, um, it can be really affected in, um, EDS is because the posterior fossa, which is the like trunk of your brain for lack of a better way of saying it back here is where your cerebellum is and right above your, which is for balance, which is part of why a lot of us have trouble with balance and proprioception. Um, cause there's off, it's often very crowded, crowded posterior fossa might be a finding on someone's imaging. Um, and so, um, right above that cerebellum and the cerebellum actually participates in this particular task, but right above that is vision. And so coordination of eye movements is coming from this area that tends to be under compression. And then it's going out to the eyes through cranial nerves that may be very affected by this excess hypermobility or even instability up in here. And so um, photophobia, um, which is like light feels almost painful, right? Or, or my eyes can't adjust when I go from a dark, like a dimly lit room to a well lit room, um, can be more common in EDS patients than in the general population. Uh, short story long there. All right. Mast cell, mast cell, you know, mast cell flares, migraines, which can be related. Yes. Right? Also related to all of the above, the, everything that you just said also are one of the Absolutely. Other things I know a lot of us um yes there are eight ways to Sunday that we can get <laughs> right uh, all related <laughs> yeah <laughs> somehow related to one another all right um somebody asked the 2020 paper that you mentioned the breathing technique so I did I don't think I mentioned a paper about breathing techniques I think what I mentioned sorry if it was unclear is that there was a paper I I honestly I don't remember who wrote it I'd have to I, I can try to dig it up and email it out um, but it was a paper that said that I think I posted it on, was I on Twitter yet? I'm not sure. But it was a paper that basically said that respiration is the pump 
that pumps the cerebrospinal fluid um, around the brain and washes it over the brain and through the spinal canal and, and then like pumps it through. Um, I think I know exactly what paper you're mentioning. I can, I'm happy to help find it too. Okay, there's, a, there's a found, there's an organization that specifically focuses on breathing. I think I know exactly what paper you're talking oh, really? about. Yeah. That I follow on Instagram. I'm like, sure. Jill, Jill eight years ago. Book. Yeah. Yeah. I know. So eight you years ago, I could it, tell you where I read stuff yeah. and how I know it. And now it's just, I've been in medicine long enough enough that I, I kind of could tell you within a year or two when I read it, but I'm not going to remember the name of the paper and who wrote it. If you can't find it, I, I'll, I'm happy to help you try to find it so that we can share um, the group if they're interested. So oh. EMDR, um, EMDR in general is done for post-traumatic stress disorder. And yes, there are people in the area who do it. Um, Julie, Bindeman, B-I-N-D-E-M-A-N, um, is one. Um, I, I think her last name might be Dubois. Her first name is Helene, um, who's right near Pike and Rose is a psychologist who does it. Um, and you can kind of Google and there's a site somewhere by the EMDR people that like lists the certified providers. Um, in terms of what we do, which is kind of a bastardized version of EMDR, it's not really EMDR, um, that we have taken that principle and applied it to be a, one of the tools in our tool basket for neurologic re-education, neuromuscular re-education. Um, I think we're probably the only ones doing that just because it was a random crazy idea that I hadn't tried and then it worked. And then I taught it to the rest of my team and we do it sometimes, but, um, there may be another crazy person out there who had the exact same crazy idea as me. And I don't know about it. Um, that certainly could be the case. Um, somebody asked, if, go ahead. Are you ready to start reading the next one? Okay. You're currently seeing a physical therapist who is not HEDS literate. So the diagnostic worksheet it is very easy to find online. If you type in EDS 2017 diagnostic worksheet, you will find it. Um, I don't have like a magic way to make a physical therapist who doesn't know about EDS know about EDS. Um, when I hire someone um, who has a good working knowledge of EDS, I still train them for a month. When I hire someone who doesn't have a good working knowledge of EDS, I train them for more than a month and we're talking, you know, 35, 40 hours a week. So I don't know how to do it in less than 120 hours right now. Um, we're working on a training manual and a training course. It's not going to be ready that soon. Um, but there, there are some resources, um, there's a book by uh, Robert Muldowney with his technique, um, which is different than ours, um, but I think works really well um, for people who, you know, do have some functions still, um, I think can do really well with that technique too. Um, and there's a book called uh, Living Life to the Fullest with EDS that he wrote. Um, so I think that would probably be a good place to start. Um, there's also the book Disjointed, which is a fabulous book that's not just about physical therapy, it's about all different kinds of things. But there is a section in it on rehabilitation and um, an expert opinion paper um, just came out, um, which is also not how I do things, but um, but it, it is a collection of some really smart people, a lot of whom I know. Um, who um, got together and um, decided to like write up recommendations for cervical instability treatment with rehab. Um, and so that is brand spanking new. I mean, it came out like in the past month or something. Um, so I'm sh since the EDS Society sponsored that, I'm sh I would guess that it's pretty easy to find on their website. Um, I go on PubMed and do like an EDS literature search every week or two. So that's where I found it. But um, I, I can't imagine it's not easy to find on their website. 
And there's actually a lot of good information on the EDF Society website. Yeah. Dysautonomia International is also a great source of information for anything dysautonomia or POTS is a type of dysautonomia uh, related. And um, there are a bunch of lectures, uh, old lectures from Dysautonomia International, EDS Society, and Mastocytosis Society on YouTube um, that, you, that are just free to watch on YouTube. Um, and some of them are only like, you know, six months old. Um, they're pretty recent. So uh, that's, that's a good way to get information as well. All right, you want to do the email questions? I think I got sure. all the ones in this queue. Did I? Um, oh, there's a couple. It says um, somebody said, right, yes, "How do you?" Hand, uh, it says, "How do you handle hypermobile patients with mental health issues such as anxiety, depression, ADHD, who aren't responding well to traditional antidepressants, ADHD medications?" So my recommendation in that case would be to do the pharma pharmacogenetic testing, um, which is genetic testing that can help figure out which antidepressant um, your body might be best at metabolizing. So there are a lot of, um, and I think very underappreciated um, metabolic abnormalities that happen in this population. Um, and they're not all described uh, in the literature. Like there's a lot of, I've seen a lot of one-offs, but I've seen enough one-offs that are different that, and I've talked to enough other, like Dr. Maitland and Dr. Rugwe and Dr. Frigamano, like other people who care for these patients and they've seen it too. And they've seen more than me because they've been doing it longer that we all, you know, acknowledge that there's varying types of immune dysfunction and varying types of drug metabolism, uh, variability, um, that these types of variability are more common in this population than in the general population, but it's an area that is still sort of like a frontier we're just getting to. So, um, I think in 20 years, there'll be a, a much better answer to that question. Like, oh, well, EDS people are more likely to have this cytochrome P450 abnormality or, you know, something like we'll discover more specific things. But for right now, there is pharmacogenetic testing um, that can be really helpful. Yeah, I concur. Sure, that. sure. I've done that personally and I've done it for my kids. And it also does help with ADHD medication, anxiety medication, not just the SRS or SSRIs or whatever in the yeah. The printout I got for my oldest son was so much more helpful than I had when I did it years ago with Dr. Sinke. And I concur. It's super helpful. And um, oh, I was going to say who ordered it for you, Dr. Pasinki. Yeah, he did. It was years ago. And thank God it was awesome. At the time it was just Genelex and they just, I just had a little card, but now I think you know, uh, my oldest did it with GeneSight and it was just such a very, very helpful. Genesite, uh, yeah. Super, yeah. We do not currently offer this, but um, in April, I have Dr. Eileen Ruhue, who's an EDS uh, specializing neurologist coming out to do um, a full day in service for um, the MDs here at PRISM. And uh, that's one of the things that I am hoping we might be able to start doing after that. Yeah, it was um, great. I mean, I don't, for anybody that hasn't had it done, I know that we were able to get it I was able to get it covered by insurance, both for me and for my son. This has been years difference. Now, I believe if somebody doesn't have insurance coverage, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Zeman, but a lot of times there's a cap of what somebody will pay cash. And from what I found out, from what I found out even or verified for my son, it was well worth it. Um, it was almost life-saving, I would dare I say. Um, I don't know how you would feel, but I know that there usually is a cap if somebody does not have insurance coverage for it. Um, in terms of what the company will, you know, the max that they will charge somebody. Never having ordered it or gotten it myself, I actually don't know the answer to that question, yeah. um, but I believe you. Yeah. Um, and you also, <laughs> also with regard to depression, um, depression is a life-threatening disease. And I think our society is really bad at mental health right? Um, why it, the fact that it's a separate insurance altogether it, it even tells you we're, we're bad at this, right? We don't even recognize that this is part of traditional standard issue healthcare, right? There's like a special treatment or perk. That's how it's treated by insurance companies and um, finding 
you know, we're, we're obviously out of network. Um, what we do, insurance companies will not always pay for, um, like a fair amount of time. So because it's all, because we spend so much time, um, but what psychiatrists do, insurance companies do pay for, they just grossly, grossly underpay for it. And so that is why there are so few psychiatrists accepting insurance in this area. Anytime you go to a high cost of living area, it's very, very difficult to find a psychiatrist who accepts insurance. Um, and so there is a huge gap for patients in terms of access to mental health care. This is a huge problem, huge problem in our uh, country because a lot of times when someone uh, comes to me and they do have severe depression and I say to them, you have a bunch of stuff going on that's all going to require a lot of attention, but there's only one thing you have going on that's life-threatening and that's the depression. And it's, it's such new news. You know, it's such new news that, oh, like with, you know, my back pain and my shoulder thing and all these things that are bothering me so much, like I had depression so far on the back burner, you know, depression never belongs on the back burner. Depression belongs front and center. So I think that's really, gosh, if I only get one point across this whole night, this whole life, I hope it's that, you know, like treat depression. Okay. To that one for sure. It's um, six o'clock exactly on the nose, Dr. Zingman. Do you have time for a couple more questions or? Yeah, I can do 10 more minutes. Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and go with one of the ones I received via email. Okay. Um, And this is actually specific to PRISM. Um, Somebody said that in summer 2022, they received an email saying that your uh, office, your clinic would be offering new services, including POTS care and regenerative medicine. And maybe you've already touched on this a little bit. Can you please explain these new services? Sure. Um, So we have expanded a lot. Um, Last summer, uh, Dr. Ayana McIntosh joined um, her primary residency training as anesthesia. Her fellowship training is pain management and interventional pain management. Um, As an anesthesiologist, who has done a lot of ICU, you know, rotations and other things that anesthesiologists do. Um, she has a very good understanding of the cardiopulmonary system. Um, and so she and I have been friends for a while and she developed an interest in EDS kind of what she watched me kind of start the practice and build the practice and everything. And she saw how, um, I mean, frankly, like sick, it was making me trying to do this all by myself Um, because my health has just been like deteriorating since we started PRISM. And prior to starting PRISM, I was, I was only, I was getting better every year. Um, And so I had always said to her, like, God, I wish you could just come work for me. And like, gosh, you could do things that I don't even do. Like you could manage pots and you could, so she started reading about pots and she got really interested in it and started reading all these papers. Um, and then she came and I taught her how to diagnose CDS and do a bunch of, you know, other things, cranial cervical instability. I mean, this is a woman who's been doing procedures on spines for years. Um, so she, you know, understands the spine, um, but certainly some of the EDS specific stuff, um, additional education was provided and Maitland came down for three days, um, and just taught her more than I ever could about mast cell activation syndrome. Um, and so she is managing those things. Um, we do not do tilt table testing here. If we feel that someone needs tilt table testing, we will refer them out to a cardiologist. We always refer out for echo. Um, and the way I describe it is we manage POTS and MCAS the way you're a, pr- a primary care doctor who is interested in diabetes manages diabetes. So if you need you know, your blood sugar is a little elevated. You need lifestyle changes, metformin. We got you. If you're a level up from there and you actually need like the semi-glutides or some of the more aggressive diabetic medications, we got you. If you need an insulin pump, you should be seeing an endocrinologist, right? So that's kind of our like ethos with managing that is, you know, we try to really fill that gap and get you care immediately 
for those things that can help start making a difference. And if your condition is so severe that it requires something that we feel really needs to be managed by a cardiologist or immunologist, we send you to one. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing with POTS and MCAS. Um, so we'll prescribe ketotophen, you know, H1, H2 blockers. I will prescribe a singular, like quite a bit of, of medication for MCAS, but when it gets to biologics, then we're sending to an immunologist. So Zolaire, IVIG, uh, Dupixent, we'll send to an immunologist for those. But no immunologist is typically going to start those until you've tried all this other stuff first anyway. So it's kind of, you know, we're getting the ball rolling and, and, and doing it that way. We do have prolotherapy and regenerative medicine here. Um, that is Dr. Alana Wright, who started either end of August or September 1st. Um, she also uh, attended the Dr. Maitland in service. Um, she also does a little bit of MCAS. She does about the amount that I do. Um, and then we'll kind of let, um, in terms of interpreting labs and making tweaks, the follow-up for that would be with Dr. McIntosh. She does, she's a sports medicine doctor. Um, who prior to coming here specialized in female athletes in the female athlete triad, which is now called relative energy deficiency of sport um, because people just like to rename stuff for us old doctors so that we have to sound stupid when we say the name from 10 years ago. Um, I'm counting myself an old doctor now. Um, so um, yeah, she's great. And, um, and she um, does shoulders, elbows, ankles, knees, wrists, hands, feet. Um, she does not do spine. So we, we still refer out for spine. Interestingly, Dr. McIntosh can do spine, but I don't have a CR <laughs> and I didn't build a leaded room uh, to put the C-arm in. Um, so we refer out for spine injections. All right, uh, how about a couple more questions? And one of them is specific to getting into CU. So I'll ask the other one first, if that's okay. Um, and then you can wrap up on one that's more specific to getting into sure. CU. Um, somebody said, could you speak to temperature dysregulation, tremors, and those of us, who, who, what can help and who can help us with these? Who, could you speak to temperature, temperature dysregulation, excuse me, tremors, and who can help us with this, these? Yeah, so um, temperature dysregulation uh, can come from a couple different things. Um, one of the things could be MCAS. Um, typically in that case, you would tend to be kind of hot because the skin flushes and you end up with like too much blood flow to your skin. And so your skin will, is literally like warm to the touch and you feel uncomfortable. You feel warm. Um, separate from that, um, people may not be able to adequately cool themselves because they may have a neuropathy um, that may be making their body not produce sweat. And sweat is, you know, one of the main ways that we cool ourselves. Um, and so small fiber neuropathy, which we do biopsies for here and diagnose here and all that stuff, um, so is, is, is pretty darn common in this population as compared to the general pub public. Um, and that's the most well-known neuropathy, but you could also, for instance, have a sympathetic ganglionopathy and it could be autoimmune. Um, and so, um, there's, that's kind of at, like at the, at the junction where neurology and immunology meet, where there's an immunologic process affecting neurologic function. Um, and those things can be pretty tricky to figure out. Um, sometimes the answer is just get the MCAS and under better control, get the heart rate better regulated and the temperature dysregulation kind of improves. Other times the answer might be going down another path, doing biopsies for things, maybe even getting the patient on um, intravenous immunoglobulin. Although um, I, I think intravenous immunoglobulin is going to go out of favor in favor of subcutaneous immunoglobulin um, because uh, there is some unpublished, I think as yet, I think unpublished data that, um, is just as effective. So, um, yeah, but giving people antibodies, um, to kind of suppress their auto antibodies, um, to their own nervous system. Um, so it typically falls into, um, 
MCAS, dysautonomia. The third thing which can be hypothesized is that chronic repetitive microtrauma to the brain stem might be making the brain stem malfunction and inflammation of the brain stem, uh, maybe preventing it from regulating heart rate, respiratory rate, temperature, other things that are autonomic nervous system regulatory functions. Did that make sense? Yes, very much so. That was very, very helpful. Um, I would assume that those go along the lines of somebody asking, I'm tying in a, a, another question that I believe is somewhat reg related in terms of just what we're more prone to and different issues that we have is that those of us that have EDS are more sensitive to mold. Also thinking of uh, one of the things that can cause what you just answered to also to be exacerbated. Um, yeah, and you know, with something like the mold, um, I think it, I think this might be Dr. Maitland's analogy. Um, have you ever heard uh, tall fences make good neighbors, <laughs> right? You know, if you have a nice tall fence uh, between your yard and your neighbor's yard, you're less likely to get pissed off about whatever's going on in their backyard that you might not like, you know? Um, and so in EDS, you can kind of think of it like all of our fences are like Swiss cheese with holes in it, you know? And so when you ingest something or inhale something, there should be these, these tall fences that keep those substances from getting deep into your tissues. Um, and the only things that should be able to go through those fences are things for which those fences have specific receptors that, Hey, when I, when I recognize this, I'm going to grab it and I'm going to put it through. And when you have stuff leaking through the fences, all of a sudden those tissues right behind the fences which are places where mast cells can, can kind of live, um, have these, in what, what the mast cells perceive as invaders in there. And so they're gonna react to that. Whereas if the connective tissue had made nice tight junctions between the cells, those mast cells would never have even known that you ate that food or you smelled that mold or whatever, you know? So. I mean, that's like a, a, a crazy oversimplification, but I think uh, the idea is, you know. I think that's a great one because it also just says it's not just about what, we expo what we're exposed to in our gut or our bladder is exposed to in our bladder. It's also, you know, environmental, it's outside. It's what our skin is exposed to our eyes. You know, we have connective tissue everywhere. And if you just think about it very simply, like you said, I think it's perfect. I mean, it makes sense to me. <laughs> As I'm laughing about different things, I'm like, I wonder if my husband's listening to this right now. <laughs> the temperature regulation, he usually looks at Actually, me. you know, when I, this is just personal, but I think it, um, I think it's a funny story um, that people appreciate. When I started this clinic, I found out so many things that I thought were like kind of quirks of mine are actually total EDS things. Yes, you feel very normal and very safe. Yeah. <laughs> so like one example is I have a really hard time with the radio in the car. Same, I told you I was allergic to noise. I've said it before. And I cannot tell you like my first six months of this practice, how many people just in an offhanded remark between things, just kind of asked about that, just said, Hey, do you know, like, is there something about EDS that would make me really sensitive to the radio in the car? And I just like almost spit my coffee out every time I said it because I have an older brother. <laughs> and, and when I would say that the noise was hurting, hurting me, yeah, it's too loud. turn it up. He would turn the volume up. I was like, I can't call him and tell him he was torturing me, you know, whatever. Yeah. But yeah, there's just all kinds of things like that, that, that are attributable to this. Well, all right. Well, a good way to wrap it up is to ask you something specifically, if that's all right. One last question to wrap it up is specifically about coming to see you and your practice and uh, what the kind of status is right now. Somebody asked if um, they had been previously a patient, let's say two years ago. So this is uh, February, 2023. If they were have not been seen since January, 2021, are they considered a new patient or like how much time has to go by until like the person is now not considered a new patient and they have to be considered I guess, or is not a current patient has to be considered a new patient. I don't know that I have an official policy on that, okay. um, but certainly 
two years would be like the outer edge of where we wouldn't consider you a new patient. However, um, you would not have to wait on the wait list if you've been here before. So you would have to do a new, what's that? Oh, oh sorry. sorry. That's okay. So you would have to do a longer evaluation because, um, you know, for all we know, you may have had nine surgeries and changed 16 meds in the past two years. Like we need to figure out what's going on with you. You may have had new subluxations of this joint, that joint. I mean, a lot can happen in EDS in two years, um, but you would not have to wait on the wait list. So you would just call our office and select the option for existing patient and schedule your appointment. Um, in terms of our wait list. So we are catching up. We are catching up with our wait list. Um, so in addition, I, I can't believe I didn't mention her yet. Uh, Dr. Sarah Cohen Solomon is a pediatrician who has EDS, who has joined our team, who is fabulous. And she treats POTS and MCAS. And, you know, we all treat, we all diagnose EDS. We all do spinal instability. Um, we all do small fiber neuropathy. Like there's some things that we all do. Um, but she does kids. She does it for kids. And she goes up to age, I think, 22 um, and she just told me, cause we used to not do under eight. Then we went down to seven. Then we went down to six and she's now willing to see like two and three year olds. Um, cause I think as she's worked here longer, she's realized, you know, there is stuff you can do, even if the kid is too young to take them through a diagnosis. Um, they, but they may benefit from, from getting PT, OT accommodations, speech therapy, other things um, at that very young age. And so it's good to get them in and, and good to educate the parents about what an IEP is for when they start kindergarten and all that kind of stuff. So, um, she's the easiest to get in just because that's the newest line of service. Like we just didn't have kids before. Um, I mean, we had a couple, but like we would make an exception once in a while, you know, cause their parent was already here or whatever. Um, so she's pretty quick to get into, um, our adult doctors, um, what we have found, so we have so many patients on the wait list is that when we email out these invites to actually schedule, a lot of people don't read their email. <laughs> and so, um, in order to get 50 appointments scheduled, I send out like 200 invites. And then the other 150 people, and we can tell who's open to the email and who hasn't. Of the other 150 people, it'll be like 140 of them never open the email. Um, and so we have to call those people, which the whole reason we spent all this time and money building this system was so that it would be streamlined and um, it wouldn't be like somebody, we had to hire another person whose job was just to call waitlist people. But I actually just hired that person. She starts on the 16th. So um, we will be getting, um, we will be able to do outreach more for our wait list. Um, so some people have gotten in, in just a couple months because like the people who were, let's say registered for the wait list between 18 months and 12 months ago, only maybe, you know, sometimes, 70% of them will schedule, sometimes 15% of them are scheduled. And then we'll have these openings that we will be able to offer out to newer people who have said like, oh, I only need a week's notice or I only need a day's notice and I can take an empty appointment. Um, or we'll have cancel. I mean, we always, we have a really strict cancellation policy. And the reason we have a really strict cancellation policy is because at least 15% of our appointments cancel every single day. So it's either like charge 15% more or have a strict cancellation policy uh, because we've chosen to take care of a population that ends up stuck in bed with migraine in the ER or with a blood pressure issue. You know, a million different things can happen um, that can make, you know, these patients not be able to come to their appointment. And so we do our best to fill the appointments so we don't have to charge the person. We do charge if we, if we can't fill it. Um, and with an extra receptionist, we'll be able to do more of that too. So if somebody, just to recap, so if somebody would like to be on the wait list, they call the office and they get on the email with, no. They, no. So okay. if you want to be on the wait list and you've never been here before, you just register for the wait list on our website. Got it. That's it. 
Okay. And then that puts you into a, it's HIPAA compliant. It puts you into um, a database in a program called Active Campaign. And then we can tell Active Campaign and Active Campaign, we can sort it by when they signed up. And we can tell Active Campaign, invite the next 150 people. And then those 150 people will get an email that has a scheduling link. And then when they click on the scheduling link, it takes them into. I don't know if you can tell when you're doing it that you're in our EMR, but you're in our EMR and you're putting yourself in for an appointment. And then once you're in for that appointment, our office calls you, make sure that you've done your paperwork and there's a deposit. Um, and then you show up for your appointment. However, if you already saw us, but it was more than like a year ago, call the office select that you're an existing patient. So you actually talk to someone because if you select that you're a new patient, you, you get sent to the, we just, I mean, we, we get 25 new patients every week signing up for our list. I mean, some weeks is 40. So, you know, I would need like two additional secretaries just to answer all those phone calls. And I don't think my patients want to pay for that. So we're trying to do as much of it through um, the like computer automated things as possible. But what we've unfortunately found, we've been doing it since uh, September, October, we started like with a few and then now we are doing it with everybody for the past like three months is that just not enough people open their emails. Yeah, sounds so like a very fair emails. way of doing it. And it sounds like it, you're right. I mean, I'm one of them. I know I'm terrible at opening emails, but a lot of times it sounds like it's a new way of doing things. I think it sounds very fair and probably just newer to a lot of us patients. So I appreciate you really going over that. Um, so that, yeah. people, and if they've been confused, uh, I know there was a question about somebody who had been on the wait list. They had received the email about what to do. So I, I really appreciate you going over that and then explain yeah. so what you're your, doing. If you're on our wait list, check your spam, like your spam yeah. box, because um, the email comes from active campaign. Yeah. And it says PRISM. So if you search for PRISM in your inbox, Theoretically, you should find it, but not every email program actually has a super functional search engine. Like Outlook's search engine is terrible. Gmail search engine's great, you know, uh, for obvious reasons. So um, yeah, so we actually hired this additional person in part so that we have the manpower to call some of these people on the wait list who never opened the email, of which there are like literally hundreds. Yeah. I believe it. Well, thank you for, for yeah. explaining it. Thank you for your time. I think that's all the time that we have um, for questions. Is that right? Oh, you're asking me. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. I just want to dump the, the, your time. You, I want to be yes. cognizant of your time. I didn't want I to. Think, I think I want to stay married, so I should probably yeah. go home now. Yeah. Well, thank you so much <laughs> for your time. Thank you for answering the questions that you did answer. Thank you for re-explaining the uh, wait list and your wait list and how people can get in to see you um, and then what they need to do if they received the email or if they didn't receive the email or if they received a phone call. Um, I think that really helps clarify some of the questions I've seen at the end um, according to your practice. Um, thank you for your what you do for the EDS patients and for young and old and your dedication to our community for sure as definitely doesn't go unnoticed. Um, and we're no, just great. thrilled to have you a part of our community. Thank you so much. Um, we will edit the recording and Danielle will share it out to everybody. And then hopefully you can come back again, Dr. Singman. Happy There's to. A lot more questions. Sorry if we didn't get to everybody's questions, but I really appreciate your time.